Thanks for staying with us. It's still Frontline on New Frontiers Television, and I am Caroline Alabi. Uh, May 29, 2021, officially marked two years in office of Governor Shei Makinde of Oyo State. And within those two years, a lot has definitely happened in the state. A lot has been happening to change the face of the state by the administration. And of course, a lot of scrutiny and criticisms has marked the administration of Governor Shei Makinde so far from critics and also from the people of Oyo State. Today we are going to be reviewing the two years of this present administration and how far they have come. And to join me in this conversation this morning is Professor Oyewo Oyelowo, Senior Advocate of Nigeria, who is the Attorney General and Commissioner for Justice of Oyo State. Good morning, sir. Good morning. Thank you very much for joining us on the show. It's a pleasure. Yes, two years. May 29, 2021 marked officially two years. Yes. If you're going to give a review of this past two years of this administration, what's it going to be? Uh, if I'm going to give a review, I'm going to start from the roadmap. Uh, during the campaign of uh, Governor Shei Makide, he presented a roadmap for governance and development of uh, or your state, which had a theme from poverty to prosperity. And from the roadmap, uh, when the administration uh, was sworn in, he immediately, you know, concentrated on four pillars. Uh, education, health, security, and the economy. And that has been the vision that has driven the administration. And if you check on health. Yeah. In, yeah. Indeed, it's like if the moment we said we were going to go out for health, we had the pandemic to test that particular promise. And we are proud to say that or your state has become the beacon of, you know, uh, achievement and accomplishment in the area of health in this pandemic season. Our approach became the guiding principle that was even adopted at the federal level. Because the first thing that came with the pandemic was panic and a knee-jerk approach and wastage of resources. But thankfully, we had a, a leadership that formulated uh, a principle of working through this pandemic that was guided by scientific information, expert counsel, and verifiable factual basis for taking decision. So you notice when some other states were wasting money building fields for, you know, uh, uh, COVID isolation. The state did not go that way. It was resolved that let's think through the COVID and beyond COVID and let the investment be for the benefit of or your state for now and for future generation. So you see the approach that was adopted was to spend that money to improve the primary healthcare centers in the local government areas. So we, we, we invested in this. So you can see that as COVID is being downgraded in its potency in our environment, those areas are also being you know, changed to primary healthcare centers. Uh, and this, for instance, has led to us to be able to give an assurance that there will be a modern, well-equipped personnel, you know, uh, manned primary health care center in every ward in Oyo State. And then when you go to education, we came and met a demoralized educational sector. Salaries were not being paid. Uh, there, were, there was no correlation match between the student population and the teachers. So immediately, uh, the, this administration swung into action under the leadership of uh, Governor Shea Makide. And uh, TESCOM and all those primary education and secondary education, they were given the mandate to quickly employ the personnel that is required. And within these two years, 5,000 teachers have been employed. Salaries of teachers have been paid. 
And when you look at even the generality of the workforce in Oyo State, what did we meet? We met a workforce that was demoralized. Salaries were not being paid. And if they are paid at all, they are paid like two times or the unpredictability. We came in and this administration set a target that everybody's salary will be paid on the 25th of the month. And since that this administration started, without fail, that has been achieved. So that has stabilized, brought up the morale something. Then we met a backlog of pensions and gratuity across board, even in the judiciary. You know, we had a situation where chief judge, justices, uh, judges have retired without being paid their gratuity and, you know, their pension issue. So we had to settle that. And now we are trying to formulate a principle of meeting up with the national uh, 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 pension scheme. Okay. You know, so the, this administration has really done a lot in that uh, 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 area. Then one of the things that we met, we, we were thrown into the crisis of insecurity by the failure of the security architecture at the national level. Why? Because under the Constitution, the primary responsibility of government is stated to be the security of life and property. And at the national level, where there is the control and the monopoly of security and armament, the government of Nigeria had failed the Nigerian people. So the Southwest governors, through the you know, uh, uh, research and work of Dawn Commission, now decided to propose an alternative that will complement the security architecture. So they came up with Western Nigeria you know, uh, security network that batted Amatekun. So you find out that in each of the southwestern states, whether you call it Amatekun or uh, neighborhood watch, we've had you know, complementary efforts by the states to bolster up the you know, failure that we found and fill in the gaps. And what has happened is that there's been a tremendous positive impact on the security, particularly in Oyo State. And even the flashpoint areas uh, like Okiogun, Ibarapa, the forest areas, uh, Ibadan, Bumosho, Oyo, by and large, we can say that there's been a tremendous improvement as opposed to what we met two years ago. So if you look at that, that is fantastic. Then when you come to economy, one of the deficits that challenge, that constitute a challenge to economic growth is the failure and gap in infrastructural development in our state. Okay. Within the period that this administration has come, we've constructed network routes you know, that have impacted on the economy. We give an example of the Okyogo Axis, where the road leading there was in shambles, you know, uh, Ibadan Isheni Road. Now, uh, what used to take people three to four hours takes them less than one hour to, 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 to cross. And don't forget that that is the basket, the food basket of Oyo State. Now, the administration in the next phase is going to be constructing uh, 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 Isheni Oyo and then Isheni Ogumosho. Why? Because the government, the federal government has been trying to construct a road for God knows how many years uh, between Ibadan and Ogumosho. Yes, they've done that of Ibadan and Oyo, but that of Oyo and Ogumosho still remains uh, uncompleted. Okay. And this has constituted a big problem in assessing Ogumosho. So, uh, alternative routes will now be available from Obomosho to Ishain, from Ishain to Oyo. So we will take the, 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 the kind of uh, load that is on that you know, federal road and share it. And then you'll find out that other rural areas will have network to be able to evacuate their summit. And then coupled with that, we are working with the federal government in having the inter, uh, Ibado uh, airport Okay. upgraded to the level that we at least if it is for cargo so that our ways are people can start earning foreign exchange by transporting their goods abroad you know we have so many 
potentials in that area. You've said so many things that yes. this government has been doing for the past two years. Yes. You've talked about roads, you've talked about infrastructures, you've talked about economic movement, you've talked about uh, education sector, healthcare, and so on. There have been concerns that this government is putting uh, the proverbial too much firewood in the fire. What, what will you say as to the concerns that probably they're handling too much than they can take? Well, I don't think so. I think the, 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 the misfortune that we have had has been poor vision and poor leadership. So we are used to third grade leadership quality. Now we're having first grade leadership quality. And when you have a first grade leadership quality, you find out that resource management becomes key. And then there is a big deficit in trust in the leadership and governance of the state. That's why I, I can remember when salaries were being paid. Some people will approach us and say, where are you getting the money? Is this sustainable? It's the money of the people of your state. You know, one of the biggest contentions that we have in governance in Africa, and Nigeria not being accept, uh, an exception, is corruption. So when you see that an administration is doing a lot, then it means that that administration is addressing management of resources. If I had to prove that, this administration has step, set up an anti-corruption agency for your state okay. to complement the federal. Because if you look at uh, the, the trend, both ICPC and EFCC, yes, they are doing their best. But how many people, how many resources of your state have they returned by investigation? How many people have they convicted from your state, either in the civil service or... Or how many loots? How much of the loot has gone off to for your state have been recovered? So it becomes very clear after studying the legal framework that brought about those, we found out that look, there's also the competence in the state to also uh, establish a framework that will complement what ICPC and EFCC is doing. That is one. Then the sustainability ideas rule the world. So what we've come up with is to have ideas in private sector, match it in public sector. We have you know, public-private sector financing. And then we also have alternative financing. I will explain alternative financing because it will resonate with the people. Hitherto, government used to do contract by mobilization. So if you want to construct a road, they'll give you 60% mobilization. So when you give somebody 60% mobilization for a 90 days contract, the likelihood is that because he has the 60%, the balance of contractual equation changes. Mm -hmm. The moment he gets the 60%, it becomes you know, more powerful than you. So what will happen is that we had a lot of uncompleted contracts. Because okay. people take 60%, and the 60% they will tell you, and then they will start coming for variation. And a contract of $2 billion may end up being $8 billion. So the alternative principle that we use in construction that has been seeing us do so much, that people think we are doing so much, which is good, of course, is we don't give you 60% mobilization. We give you zero. We enter into contract with you, and we give you an irrevocable you know, uh, 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 um, charge on the resources of the state, the internal generated revenue of the state. So what happens is that we, we, we bring intelligence into even contracting with contractors. So we say, we give you this contract, you take it to the bank, and we give the bank the assurance that when you complete the contract, we pay you. So what it means is that for, 90, for that 90 days of contract, we are not paying you any 60%. So you, the balance of contracting is still in our favor. You have to go to sites, you have to mobilize, there's no mobilization. You have to construct and show us proof with certificate of performance verified by our experts before we pay you. So what do you think will happen? Do you have to chase that person? No. He knows that if he doesn't complete that, the bank, we won't pay him. The bank will be on his uh, neck. So what, has, what we have seen is that the contractors now know that performance goes with pay, payment. No performance, no payment. And what that means is that there is nobody we are chasing around. We have had less litigation 
in contract in terms of with contractors saying variation this what you have is what is you get so when people say we are doing too much is because there's too much to do there's been lack of vision i know the the word of god say people perish for lack of vision we don't want to perish for lack of vision there is a roadmap there is a vision that is we are not having a knee jerk you know and we are not doing our politics and all those kinds of things no this is a promise made to the people of Oyo State, which is being kept. And for the remaining part of the two years, we intend to keep even more of those promises. All right. Now, of course, um, Governor Chaymakide is of another faction on politics. We know that Nigeria operates a multifactorial party yeah. system. Now, of course, there will always be critics that will come from different political parties to say, this is not working, you're not doing this right. How do you think this administration has been able to handle all of these criticisms? We just discussed one, them saying probably, you know, it's handling too much. How do you think this administration has been able to properly handle these criticisms? Well, you know, the, the thing is that uh, there is no, no way in the world where somebody is not criticized. Uh, criticisms can be constructive, criticism can just be negative. And most times in Nigeria, criticisms are pure, pure negative, you know, malicious criticism, baseless, with no iota of, uh, you know, substance. <coughs> and even the, 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 the world's biggest democracies are experiencing it now. Uh, you find uh, in America, there's what you call alternative truths or alternative facts to the extent that a person who lost an election is still claiming that uh, he won that election and is still claiming that in August he will come back. But the reality will always give a lie to the criticism that is baseless. So what is the reality in Oyo State? The people of Oyo State are seeing what is going on. So the taste of the pudding or amala is in the eating. If you have never eaten our abula and uh, amala, with fresh fish or goat meat or chicken. It is still a fanciful thing. But the day you eat it, you know the taste of it. And that is what this administration is all about. We don't uh, engage that much on social media because you'll be wasting a lot of your energy and resources engaging distractors. You know, you can But if people bring constructive issues to our attention, we will attend to it. So, in fact, one example I give is the security situation. There is uh, a, a, a kind of uh, uh, an ICT center that was designed by previous administration that was not working. When this administration came, we were more concerned about making it work. And when it started working, the criticism was that it was not initiated by us. And we think, are you for real? This is something that is supposed to work for the people of your state. If somebody starts it and somebody makes it work, like we say in our Yoruba palace, <laughs> so, I mean, I don't get it. So, it's the money of the people of your state. So, if you say, oh, somebody started contract, he didn't complete it until, you know, so, if we are taking a new paradigm where people abandon projects and, and that's wastage of resources. So that's one criticism. Oh, uh, you didn't conceive it. Sure, it was conceived for the people of your state mm -hmm. and you didn't make it work. And for not working, you know, it's like a building, this building, when it was being constructed, until you finish it, it's not useful. So if you do it even 75% and it's not completed, it's not useful. But if somebody comes and completes it, it's useful, you know? And the people of the or your state are... So most times when people are doing constructive criticism and we hear it, we address it. The projects are meant for the people of your state. And for as many of such abandoned projects that we think were well conceived and can serve the people, they will be completed and they will serve the people. Or other criticism is that uh, we want to borrow, we want to do this. These are things that are subjected to scientific and modern way of doing business. Uh, we got approval from the government to do some bonds for infrastructure and development. And why are we doing this? Now, you notice that we have the rail line between Ibadan and uh, 
I hope you have gone on the rail. Have you traveled by train? I've actually. Oh, you should travel by train. In <laughs> fact, I prefer now sometimes to go by train. train. That because uh, the train has the time it picks up. In fact, when I first went, I almost missed it <laughs> because I thought it was a Nigerian thing. Damn. So I got there, I think quarter to eight, and uh, to buy a ticket to spend five minutes and all that. As I was entering, I saw everybody running. Oh, where is it going to take off off by eight? <laughs> And lo and behold, I sat down there. Five minutes, they said, everybody that's not traveling should get out, that we are moving by it. Eight o'clock on the door, mm -hmm. the thing moves. Mm -hmm. And then they said, we'll get there in two and a half hours. Two and a half hours on the door, we got there. To the extent that those that were supposed to come and pick me were not there. Because they thought... <laughs> <laughs> so things are improving, thankfully under this administration. Uh, the Ibado Lagos Expressway, we hope the federal government will complete it. So we can't sit down. Mm. It's, it's when you invest in infrastructure that things will go. And that's why we are looking at the train, the railway corridor. We are looking at the express corridor. We have a circular road that has not been completed. And of course, the government is taking initiative to make sure that the person who is doing it is put off and the person who can do it can, can come on. Then we have the airport that we want to. So all these things, they take investment so it is those investment that we want to put and we hope to attract and we're already attracting you know uh, saturday train for instance they call it a bed train it comes eight o'clock from uh, uh, lagos and leaves by 6 p.m mm -hmm. always full why because people want to come to ibada now so it's investment mm -hmm. if you want to make progress in life you have to invest and that's why we are investing and apart from investment, we are making sure that we get value in whatever we invest in. Before now, roads were being constructed in a way. I remember the first time I was discussing a road contract with uh, the governor one on one. The man is an engineer. He saw everything. He said, Prof, this one, ele, ele, ele. that's what is called. So even in construction, in everything, we have somebody that is competent and that's why we, we you know is the engineer of modern or your state is engineering it in a way for the future and it's engineering it in a way that you know there are other aspects of this administration that has to do with the governor himself that have not even you know, <laughs> well, apparently this, this administration has a lot to boast of and yes. one of the things they've also boasted of is the fact that they've been able to boost the internal generated revenue exactly. of the state. How have they been able to do this considering the fact that, uh, let's not even go into the many things that they have put in place. Just uh, last week, the governor reduced um, by 25% the school yeah. fees of Lautech students. Just yesterday, it wasn't the news that I was able to add to the allowance of um, Youth core members. Yeah. So we're talking about. It wasn't today. last week. It's this week. This week. That it, was, it, this, yes. the, the, the reduction of the. Uh, that was, that was this, this week. week. Yeah. So so many things yeah. has been done, yeah. and we're still boosting the internal generated yeah. revenue of the state. How is he able to handle all of these things in such a way that they are not going to affect the state? Okay, I, I mentioned one thing that the governor, you know, is always hammering on, and that's the issue of trust. You know, trust is built on care. And trust is built on humanity. If, if, if you see me that I have concern for you and I act in a way that is to your benefit, it will build trust. In fact, trust is built on love. You know? So, one of the attributes that you find in this particular governor is his humaneness, his humanity. When you say something, he will tell you what... i give you an example. We are at a dinner and uh, an issue about Okada. We, all of us are concerned about Okada, menace and all that. And in Lagos, they ban Okada. In Oyo State, it was proposed that we should also ban Okada immediately. But the approach of the governor was to look at who are these Okada people. There are categories of Okada people who, this is their daily bread. And they are citizens of Oyo State. There are categories of Okada people that are engaged in criminality. Now, if you don't make that 
distinction and you throw the ban at them, then you are throwing the baby out with the bath water. So what is being proposed is to, one, determine who are these people in Okada. So that's registration. And that's one of the areas that brought IGR. Mm. Because uh, they, they, they engage with them and ask them how much they could pay. And on the basis of what they could pay, they started enforcing it, which means that more people were willingly paying it. So one, you have taken their, them into consideration. Then two, we are going to regulate them that those engaged in criminality will be exposed. And what will happen is that those who have genuine interest would automatically become informants against those that are against their interests. The same thing when they said ban street trading. You know, they came with a program, ban street trading and all that. In fact, the first thing he said is, find out who are these street traders. Some of them are the breadwinners, the only source of income for their family. So if you ban them, where are they going to go? They will have no alternative than to go into criminality. So say instead of banning, banning them, banning them, create an avenue for them, a market or a night market where they will have an alternative to earn income. And that was what was done. And it was very easy to convince these people, move away from the street, move to this place that has been created for you. And that's what has informed, you know, policy and implementation. You have to take the people of your state along. The same thing when COVID-19, they said lockdown. You know what the governor said? He said, if you lock down, some people won't survive it. It'd be gone to my home. So don't lock down. Let's regulate the hours and let's monitor it. And we had the, the medical team that would tell us, oh, there is a high concentration of COVID positive people coming from this area. So those areas can be locked down. The other areas can, you know. So you will find that even recently when the federal government said lockdown, we are asking where is the data? Where is the information that informed this decision? And that is what governance is all about. Governance, and you know, democracy is government of the people, for the people, by the people, and unto the people. So once you remove people out of it, there, is, there will be a deficit. This government is people-driven. Why? It was brought in by the people. It wasn't brought in by a godfather. It wasn't brought in by a set of people who are constituted authority or whatever. This was a government that was brought in by mass voting of the people. And that is what, you know, is it's driving and propelling the administration to do more for the people. When you do more for the people, let anybody say whatever he says. You know, it's like that uh, blind man when they were asking him. He said, I was blind. Now I can see. Whatever, you know, people could tell you uh, there was a time when our salary was not coming in. Now, somebody is paying our salary. Somebody is paying pension. When we are we <laughs> Why are you been talking about the humanity of, of mm. Governor Sheyi yes. There have been concerns that maybe this humanity is affecting the firm implementation of policies that have been made. Now, you talked about the fact that you had to regulate Okada right? Yeah. During the COVID-19 pandemic, people were worried that maybe there was some things that were not done right. Probably they weren't handled the right way. How well do you think this governor has been able, or let me say this administration, be able to really implement firm policies in such a way that when it is said like this, it is actually done like this. You see, the, the beauty is knowledge. When you have knowledge, you have power. And that's why knowledge is power. Uh, most people who comment, comment out of lack of knowledge. They don't see the thing. It's he who wears the shoe that knows where it pinches. He is the governor today. The policies are made they are articulated, they are thoroughly... In fact, we've made so much policies and we back them up with law so that there's consistency in administration even after our going. We make COVID-19 regulations which was being followed. What knowledge informs is that it makes you to be able to do things differently because your policies are based with the knowledge of the people, with the knowledge of the phenomena you want to regulate, with the knowledge of the mechanisms that are available and making choices. So, uh, 
I, I remember somebody saying that, oh, uh, you, you bad, uh, I know your state, who fair to Ruru? Ruru for what? Ruru is not the thing. It's being able to deliver. And you only Ruru, Koko Ruru Sha, you know? But this is somebody that's that cerebral, you know, and driven by a purpose and a vision. And if I am, if he is the one conceiving the vision, I believe that he knows before coming how to get it done. So in terms of getting it done, uh, he may not wear a strong face and all that. In Africa, we are used to tyrants. He's not a tyrannical person. He's not a tyrant. He's a, a democrat. And that's a difference. It's a democrat. It's somebody, democrats do things in a way that doesn't, you know, infringe on the right of people. And they don't do things with disrespect to the dignity and the value of a human being. And that's what makes the difference. Still on implementation. Now, we had the Asaba declaration by South southern west governors that came along to say well these are one of the things that we want and that is to ban open grazing now this is not the first time that we're hearing of an open grazing ban in southwest ibado was uh, followed by on this it was one of those people that said we're going to ban open grazing by the yeah. fulani headsmen now we have the amoteko we know that part of their duties but what is the assurance that this policy is actually going to be seriously held on especially in oil states okay now one of the things you need to know is that already or your state has an anti-grazing law. Having the law is not going to bring about its implementation. So, in fact, uh, the governor announced this week that there will be machineries that will be put in place to ensure that the declaration against anti-grazing will also be followed through in Oyo State. When you want to do that, typically there are stakeholders in this, you know, cattle rearing. And what people know now in Oyo State is that it's not only Fulanis that are engaged in cattle rearing in Oyo State. If you go to Kyogun, you say there are indigents of Oyo State who have invested in this. So what you do is you engage with the stakeholders. You sensitize them. And you identify the violators. And those violators will now be confronted with the enforcement and with the full force of the law. And this is a process where a government, government cannot just jump into, you know, and then we are not a military government. Don't forget that even at Mateko, they do not carry the kind of arms that even headers carry. Why? Because the control of arms is under the Firearms Act and it's under the jurisdiction of the federal government. So we can't blindly go and confront somebody that has AK-47 with uh, Shakabula. <laughs> so it needs for coordinated planning and for implementation that will bring a win-win situation for everybody, both dealing in uh, uh, cow and also for the populace to be able to... You don't want to escalate it that will bring another insecurity uh, problem. Talking about insecurity, the issue of insecurity yeah. has been a very touchy subject in Ibadan, or your state has, a, oh, it has been quite worrisome. And people to a certain extent feel like maybe enough is not being done to safeguard the lives of people of or your state. What, what, what do you think about this, that the administration is probably not doing enough to protect our people? Well, I think we have to have an understanding of the uh, security architecture that we have in Nigeria. If you look at the security architecture under the constitution, it is unfortunately controlled by the federal government. Absolutely. You have the Nigerian police force, or the Nigerian police. You have the civil defense, you know, complementing them. They all have guns. Then you have the armed forces, the army, the air force, the, you know, navy, and all that. We don't have C here, so we don't have Navy. So what it means in essence is that primarily the security weapons that you need is in the hands of another person. Then in terms of operational command and control, it is not in the hand of governor. But what happens is that the administration complements and works with you know, the commands within the state. So you work 
with the commission of police you work with i i i, I, I um, uh, uh, sss and all the other agencies but w so what that has led to in Oyo state is they have come together we have what you call operation bust which is the police the uh, all the security networks in Oyo state then we now have Amoteku. Amoteku do not bear arms. They don't have the power, power, repeated something. What they do is they complement with all the shakabula that farmers and hunters use, and probably koboko. And some people say they have betu betu or whatever, you know. But the bottom line of it is that the kind of sophistication that you see in the bandits, the headers, and all that. They cannot be matched by Amateko. That's one. Then two, there are non-state actors in the security, you know, area. Okay. So what we have done in your state, and that's why I, we can say relatively that this administration has impacted positively on the security network. So we engage non-state uh, actors. You have OPC. You have all these miati Allah, you have all so you engage them. So in engaging them, you now have bodies at the local government at ward and all that. And then you have Amateko at every ward. And then in equipping Amateko, you determine the kind of things. So for instance, if a person wants to go through the forest, they're not going to give him a jeep. So we have Amateko that have uh, you know uh, motorcycle. And then also we have forest rangers. And then the non-state actors are the people that are in the forest, like uh, Agbekoya, the other, the hunters and all that. So you engage them. So you find out that when we have a problem in the, ho in the forest, information which is very intelligence, which is very important, will come from the people who are in. And how do you do it? Non-state actors. So they'll tell you, oh, the people you are looking for, they are here. And that's when that information you now relate, you know. So security is not something that one solution will solve in Nigeria until the whole security architecture is, is, is overhauled. And the state is given a prominent position. And you find out that in some states, because the states belong to the federal government or whatever, you know, for one reason, the state operators are given opportunity to carry arms. In the north, there are some, some state uh, operators that carry arms. But don't, don't forget, in the southwest, uh, people feel that the southwest, uh, having the uh, south, uh, south, uh, western Nigeria network security is a regional something that is going to break away. No. And it's been established that it is to complement because you know the jingle that they have in Oyo State? Ifura, Papa Ofura, Papa Juno, Aja Ofura, Aja Ji. Only two Ofura, only Nyoko. So we can't raise up our hands and say we don't have guns. So within the uh, resources we have, we are doing our best. But don't forget also the Yorubas will say, Awo Kajulu, Weni Ki Anya Gunafa, Bi Anya Toi Bo Gunafa, Awo Ni Kajulu. So we have a fundamental flaw in our security system. Until we address the fundamentals constitutionally to change the overbearing control of the federal government in the security and reform the police, reform the army, we will continue to do our best. But the real authority for combating and the, the power to push people coming from our side lies in the federal government. But thankfully, with the resources we have and with the intellectual engagement and professional you know, uh, usage and deployment of the resources, Oyo State has been able to get value for money to the extent that more and more we are seeing that we are counting days of peace, not days of war and not days of chaos and, you know, Let's talk about one thing that this insecurity did affect. We talked about the fact that Okio Guani Barapa is one of the major food baskets of Oyo State, and they've been at the um, they've been at the end of 
the receiving end of this major yeah. insecurity issues. And well, to a certain extent, it has also affected food production and how it comes into the main cities of Oyo State. And this has affected the prices of food. How do you think the government is helping mitigate this effect so that you know the average and common man will be able to afford simple things like pepper and, and meat? Because really, their prices are becoming worrisome and quite unaffordable. Well, in, in uh, this, this uh, reality that uh, we met on the ground, uh, when we came in, there was rabid, you know, insecurity in Okyogun. And uh, people could not go to their farms. So the first uh, of the initiative, even before Amatekun, was agro-rangers. So the agro-rangers are the people that help the farmers to be able to uh, feel secure and whenever they feel that there is threat they report and so through the agro rangers Amateko, operation bust and all the police and all that we are able to address this you know uh, this problem however uh, the problem has not gone away totally mm -hmm. it will be a lie for anybody to say that we've gotten to the point that we were before the insecurity started because uh, the, 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 the players in that area have tasted the, the, the fruits of their criminality. Uh, people like uh, Governor Erufai said, people who did not earn 100,000 naira a month are now earning 100 million uh, a month. So it will take uh, consistent, persistent, and sustainable effort to rid uh, those places totally and absolutely of those criminal elements. But within the resources available, I think a lot has been done. The situation we inherited in 2019 and 2021 is totally different. Uh, you don't hear about killings like we're hearing you know, all the time. But that is not to say that there's still, there are still pockets, but those pockets have been, you know, uh, have been addressed. Okay. So as they come, and don't forget, we also have, uh, you know, free toll, uh, something for people to call in. Call in okay. So once you call in, there are centers that will direct that. Uh, like this morning, somebody called. They said there was something in the do or somewhere. Um, Operation Bust was immediately deployed uh, to the place. I'm a tech where everybody. So there are uh, citizens' participation too. So we appeal to our citizens too. Okay to cooperate with the government. Where you find out that there is insecurity, they should use the toll-free number, report to you know, police, report to Amateko. The moment we own the whole system, instead of criticizing all the time, uh, it affects us. You know? uh, it affects everybody. So we, are, we should be each other's keeper. And once we work together, I think those people who are strangers in our midst can easily be identified, particularly those whose intention is to harm us. Uh, if we keep on saying uh, it's the government, at the end of the day, uh, the harm will be borne by all of us. Yeah. And the pain of each or your state person is the pain of the government of uh, 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 engineer Shei Makide. Thank you so much, Commissioner for Justice, Professor Oyewo Oyelo. And we've been talking it's about Oyelo Oyewo. Oyewo. Oyelo Oyewo. 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 My oh. first name is Oyelo. My father's name is Oyewo. <laughs> <laughs> okay, Professor Oyelo Oyewo. My yes, apologies. Yes. We've been talking about the two years administration of Governor Sheyi Makinde, the pros, the cons. And finally, before I let you go, just, just quickly, you've given us so much reviews about what has happened, what he's doing. We have two more years left of this administration. Very quickly, sir, what should we expect? Well, like the governor is saying, expect more of what you've already seen. Prosperity. Prosperity, which is what we have promised. Delivering on the four-point agenda, education, health, security and economy to make Oyo State, you know, uh, a, a place where people live not only just to deal with problems, but to also prosper. And we want to be able to also invite foreign direct investment into this place. Uh, we couldn't go into all that, uh, but there are potentials. You know, we have minerals, uh, and we are also even addressing problems of energy. Okay. You know, we have Minister of Energy now, uh, we, we are trying to deal with the NEPA problem 
from the uh, Oyo State perspective, which is quite original. You know, like when people ask, why do you have a Ministry of Energy and all that? Do you have Nepal? I said, no. <laughs> the Constitution allows us within the framework to operate and we are doing that. So uh, what, we prom what the administration has promised gets hold of the roadmap and see uh, what is going to happen within the next uh, two years. I remember when uh, Governor Sheimakide went to Obumasho. Interestingly, I come from Obumasho. And he said Obumasho is the second largest city in Oyo State. But there, is, there are no tokens of such civility and modernity. So at least let's have a flyover that shows that it's not only in the Ibadan you see a flyover. So before this administration, he has promised flyover. He has promised to upgrade the, uh, you know, Okiogun. We are seeing a lot of uh, development. We are creating institutions of, uh, you know, in uh, Ajia. Uh, a lot. Uh, and, so and I can tell you within what we have seen in the last uh, two years, we are going to see even more of it right. uh, before the, uh, the, the, the administration you know, renders its account in 2023. Great. So much to look forward for. Thank you so much, Nadia, for being on the show. And that's the very much we'll be taking on Frontline this morning. Thank you once again for joining us. I am Caroline Alabi. Have a beautiful rest of your day.